Well, welcome everybody to tonight's event. My name is Alex Maus uh, from the Association of Jewish Refugees on behalf of the AJR. Thank you so much for, for joining us for another online event. We are so pleased to once again be hosting this, co-hosting this event in partnership with Insiders Outsiders. Um, this uh, the series of events this month is in the lead up to and over the duration of Refugee Week, which is next week, so it's all very fitting. And it, it occurs to me now, um, Monica, as we're coming up to another Refugee Week, that it's now been a year since we've been co-sponsoring these events together. <laughs> That's how it began uh, just a year ago, which seems remarkable. But how successful they've been, and the fact that on a beautiful night like tonight, at least here in London, uh, that people are still joining us for these sorts of things um, says so much about the the amazing content that um, Insiders Outsiders has been putting on. So thank you for that. Um, the AJR, the Association of Jewish Refugees, uh, honors the stories of emigres, Jewish emigres from Nazi Germany uh, who escaped to Britain and the families that they left behind. And we continue to work with those who are still with us. We provide a range of social welfare services. Increasingly, we have amongst our membership members of the next generations, the children and grandchildren of those refugees and survivors of the Holocaust. Um, if you know anyone who would be interested or who could benefit from our services, please do find us online at ajr.org.uk. Um, I don't have too much to say by way of introduction, uh, other than how much I'm looking forward to this, uh, what looks to be a, a fascinating event, very much in keeping with the spirit of, of AJR's core mission. Just a few brief housekeeping details. Um, as usual, this event is being recorded. Um, if you want to ensure that you're not seen on the recording, the easiest way to, to do that is just to switch off your camera. We won't mind. Um, but otherwise, it's nice to see faces out there. So um, please do leave your camera on if you're comfortable doing so. Uh, everyone is on mute, um, uh, except for our speakers will be able to mute, unmute themselves when it's their, their turn to speak. And if you have questions during uh, uh, the talk, we will have time towards the end to, to answer them, but as and when they come to you, please do um, type them into the comments or, or into the message box and direct them please to Monica Bomduchin, um, who will be the, uh, the keeper uh, of the questions and she'll relay them to our, our panelists and our speakers towards the end. So that's all from me and um, over to you, Monica, to welcome our guests. Lovely, thank you very much, Alex, and a big welcome on behalf of Insiders Outsiders, uh, which, as many of you, I hope, will by now know, was in, originally designed to be a year-long nationwide festival taking place in, from March 2019 to March 2020, essentially to celebrate the hugely diverse and rich contribution of refugees from Nazi Europe to this country's culture. And you can see that this event tonight fits absolutely into that uh, slot, as it were. And what happened with lockdown, luckily, the festival came to an end just around the time, you know, the lockdown happened. And we decided, for obvious reasons, to go online and very often in partnership with the AGR, it's been my great pleasure to have put on a whole range of different events virtually, but as Alex says, the fact that so many of you are here are a tribute, well, of course, I think to Julia and uh, her mother, but also I think to the kind of continued interest in this rich cultural terrain. So without further ado, I'd like to start by introducing, first of all, Joachim Schler, and then Julia herself, and later Julia Weiner, who will be talking about um, uh, Liesl's later life in, in this country, whereas Joachim, in the first instance, will be talking about her early life and her transition to life in the UK. So Joachim Schler is a professor of modern Jewish and non-Jewish relations at, in, uh, in history, that's the official title, at the University of Southampton, as well as being the co-editor of the journal Jewish Culture and History, and also of a new online journal called Mobile Culture Studies. I could go on much longer, but I'll just say that his research interests for many years have focused primarily on the cultural history and ethnography of migration and mobility, of urban life, and of the reflection of history in the individual experience as he 
has put it himself. And I think you'll see that his uh, book, his account of Liesel's life very much fits into that category. Uh, many of his publications, indeed, again, very much like the one that will be the focus of today's event, um, are based on personal documents, letters, diaries, photo albums of German Jews who emigrated to Palestine in the first instance, perhaps, and also, of course, elsewhere, including this country, including the UK after 1933. Well, Liesl's daughter, Julia, I think probably needs very little introduction, but let me just very briefly, and Julia, I've just realized I meant to check with you in what order I'm supposed to give your many <laughs> titles, but forgive me if I get it slightly wrong, Rabbi, Baroness, Julia Neuberger, DBE, um, has been across life, across bench. Sorry, there's a bit of background noise. I wonder if we could make sure that everybody is uh, muted. Across uh, bench life peer in the House of Lords since 2004 and a much respected social commentator, broadcaster and writer for many years. Until recently she was, as many of you will know, senior rabbi at the West London Synagogue and as I'm sure most of you will know, has the great distinction of having been the second ever female rabbi in this country. And again, I could go on. She has many, many hats, uh, as well as being a rabbi and indeed involved in the world of politics. Uh, most of them, the others to do with health in one form or another. But I think I'll leave it at that and hand over, first of all, to Joachim to set the scene and get the ball rolling, as they say. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I have to say I live on a big street. There might be some police or whatever sirens in the background uh, from time to time. Um, really glad and excited to be here. I, I would like to start by telling, telling the story how I came to this when Julia Neuberger gave a talk at the University of Southampton uh, some years ago. She, she mentioned that her mother, on, on the last day of her life, somehow had forgotten her acquired English and only spoke Schwäbisch, German dialect, and, and mentioned going home and connected that home to the city of Heilbronn in southwest Germany. And since this happened to be the city where I was born, I, I got interested. And I went up to her after the talk, and, and we started talking, and Julia said, I have letters. So a while later, we met in London and, and Julia brought in boxes and we opened them and there were bundles of letters nicely bundled up. And I was fascinated and, and intrigued to, to such an extent, I think, that, that Julia somehow immediately said, take them, <laughs> take them with you. Uh, so I schlepped the letters to Southampton and, and then to Berlin. And then one day I started opening them trying to bring them into a chronological order, um, starting in the year 1936 and going up to the year 1948. So it's not a live story, obviously, that I could write, but the story of what happened between 1936 and 1948. Um, so I'm trying to share my screen here. This is her. Uh, born 1915, so 17 years old, around uh, the year 1932. This is the place where she grew up. The family's wine store and cellar, Rosenthal and Dornacher, established in Götzenturmstraße. One of the families that moved from the villages outside to the city of Heilbronn, creating a new modern Jewish community. This is a, a beautiful invoice. It also, again, shows the house. Um, they lived in this house in Innsbrucker Straße 12 first before moving into quite a beautiful modern one, as you can see here, in Mozartstraße 10 in January 1933, which is obviously a crucial date in German history and the history of a family. This is the mother, Hermine, before she was married to Ludwig Rosenthal, who was a soldier in the First World War in the German army, Fati here on this picture, a prisoner of war in Marseille, from where he returned. This is again the photograph he found later from her school friend Johanna Eckert's photo album, again in the year 1932, a young girl in a traditional family. The grandfather, Dr. Moses Engelbert, was the first rabbi of this modern Jewish community. A young girl with ideas, with new ideas, with an interest in the arts, but of course with a connection to both the city and its Jewish community, which is 
both, re both reflected here in this postcard. In 1937, when she worked in a bookshop in Frankfurt, Liesel decided on her own to leave Germany. She went to London. There was an interesting, I can say, love story that brought her for a while to the city of Bombay, but she returned only to learn what happened in Germany from her British perspective now, Kristallnacht in Heilbronn, when the parents were still there. There's an uncle, Jakob Wertheimer, in Switzerland, who tries to encourage the family, Ludwig and Hermine, to leave. There's a huge correspondence, nearly daily postcards sent across the channel from Heilbronn to Liesel, who started in Birmingham, but then is in London. The first thing she manages is to bring her brother, her brother Helm, Helmut, later Czech, over to London and then to convince her parents to finally make the step. Ludwig Rosenthal copies regulations for the immigration of refugees to Britain, but they also, also think of Uruguay and Australia and, and many other places. In London, she meets Anna Schwab, who heads the German Jewish Aid Committee. She creates a circle of friends, a new network of work colleagues that will then really in a way against the, the advice of her parents uh, allow her to find the guarantors to bring her parents over to London. Here we find them uh, in London, the two families, that's the, the parents again um, in 1960. And then finally, this is Liesl, and with her, obviously, is Julia, who is uh, with us today, the photograph taken in, in 1955. What I found fascinating is that this is a story of a young woman who makes her own decisions. In a way, she experiences emigration as a kind of emancipation from her parents. The parents are very like, conservative, traditional uh, family values are important. And in, in that sometimes it seems the most important thing for the parents is to see her daughter married. So there's a long, long cascade of letters from Heilbronn giving advice to finally marry. Maybe even the guy in Bombay or somebody else doesn't matter, but to, 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 to lead an orderly life. And, but they regard as in a way disorderly and, and motivated by crazy ideas about the arts and about independence is what will in the end save their lives because she is able to create this, this network of communication with other Heilbronners who have moved, really exploded all across the globe, I have had correspondence with people in Argentina, in Australia, in the United States in, in other countries trying to give more flesh, if, if you want, in, in my research to these, to these letters. But basically, the book is really constructed on the letters. I have tried to, to write the history from the letters. So things have been missing, things I haven't, I haven't learned, I have people I, I haven't met. It is a fragmented story obviously due to the very character of, of this immigration that nearly destroyed um, family and community cohesion uh, through Nazi persecution and people being forced to, to suddenly develop new geographical fantasies, if, if you like, to think about wine growing for wine merchants family, wine growing in Chile or in Australia. And developing all sorts of plans, running to consulates, trying to apply for a passport, for a visa, all these procedures that I summed up on as, as cultural practice of emigration. Emigration sounds so abstract, but it's a, it's a concrete process of, 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 of daily work and often daily desperation. We have letters from the mother who sits at the Jüdische Hilfsverein, the, the Jewish aid organization in, in, in Stuttgart, for, for days really trying to find a way out. They don't believe at first that her daughter, that their daughter will be able to support them. They, they criticize her a lot. The, the, the tone becomes really sharp at times. 
Well, and then she manages. And then the parents come over very late in spring, April and May 1939. The brother is already there. So the family, part the core family, let's say, is being reunited. Other members of the family, as they will later learn, do not survive. So there is a clear connection between the history of the emigration and the history of the Holocaust. Once the parents are in London, they immediately want to move in together again, but obviously her independence has, has achieved such a level that she, that she cannot do that anymore. She has found a, a, a job with Marks and Spencer. She lives through the Blitz. She marries finally, which is a, a, a very quick event uh, in all that story, nearly not mentioned in the letters, which I find quite, quite intriguing. Um, Walter Schwarz, Anna Schwarz's son, who is obviously a soldier, so it will take until May 1945, the, the end of the war, uh, for them to, to reunite again. She keeps in touch, which was very interesting for me, with other Heilbronners, Heilbronners who have found their way to New York, to Chicago, to Buenos Aires, to, to Sydney. It's a small community of about 700 people, but now we find them really all over the globe. And this kind of transnational network is, is really global. On the other hand, it has a common denominator in this old city of Heilbronn, which was a very democratic city where the Nazi takeover was particularly cruel and, and, and brutal against not just the Jews, but also social democrats and other political opponent, opponents. And then, of course, they all hear the news that on the 4th of December 1944, the city of Heilbronn has nearly completely been destroyed. Um, this was the memory focus for the city of Heilbronn throughout the post-war period. But interestingly, and that's my last part, many of them try to get in touch again with their hometown, the hometown they have had to leave, uh, relatively soon after the war. Um, particularly uh, Liesl's parents, Hermine and Rosenthal, they write letters to the mayor. The mayor is interested. The mayor creates his own network of Auslandsheilbronner, foreign Heilbronners, which I found a fantastic construction, and they're stored away in the city archives under their title. And they send letters to the city telling about their fate, particularly Fritz Wolf from Naharia, an, an old friend of hers, who is really a poet and who, who understands, he's very sensitive in his dealings uh, with the city, with, with Mayor Paul Meile. They travel back. Um, the city is open for that. The city informs them about post-war development, architecture, all the big successes of, of the Wirtschaftswunder, post-war Germany. Um, None of them do return. They do return in mind, in, in spirit, in, in a kind of linguistic connection. They all speak with a Schwäbisch accent like I do. Um, but of course, it's a different history. There, there is no way of, of, of really connecting to the history before that destruction. But they keep in touch, and, and that forms the last part uh, of, of the book, how the city then as one of the first in, in Germany really um, starts to deal with its Jewish history, they commission a book which comes out in 1963, very early, on the history and fate of the Jews of Heilbronn. And not only the famous medieval settlement uh, of the 10th and 11th centuries, but until its destruction under, under the Nazis uh, in, in, in the 20th century. And I think it was that kind of spirit that makes Heilbronn maybe a little bit different from other German cities that reflected again when I approached them and said, listen, I, I found letters from a, from a lady who, who was from Heilbronn. Would you be interested? And immediately they were interested and um, took over all my plans of publication and said, no, we do that. It's, a, it's, it's an obligation uh, for us to do that. And in January 2016, they invited Julia to a really fantastic event, I thought. Um, I was very proud of my, uh, of, of my hometown. Um, my old mother was there, and many people were there. It was a very exciting moment, and Julia could enter her name in the Golden Book of the City. And 
um, it, it, it was really quite something. And they now use the book um, in teaching in, in, in schools, which I also find uh, quite unusual and, and really admirable. Um, yeah, and then it has been translated into English. Uh, thankfully, it's it's a bit ex expensive, I have to admit. I, um, what can I do? It's a, it's a more academic publication than the German one, which was uh, indeed a, a kind of labor of love that I, that I really um, admired. And I was very happy that I was able to tell, say, part of the story. The interest in the arts is there in, in her youth, but then circumstances make it impossible for her to, to really study the arts, but, but, but she sticks to that. Um, although the parents keep saying, forget about these, these crazy ideas. Uh, but the interest in art is something for the later part of this talk. So thank you very much. Shall we hand over now to the other Julio? Is that what I think probably the best thing to do and then open up the conversation with uh, Julia Neuberger herself? Or Joachim, did you want to address any specific questions to Julia now? No, sure, I have so sure. many questions, of course. But um, I, I mean, maybe for for those who listen to us, how was this, Julia? How was this, this this family history related to you? Was it was it present? Did did they talk about it, um, or, or was it stored away like the letters were in 1948? Um, so I think the thing that I ought to say first, Joachim, apart from the fact that it was completely wonderful that you did it, it was completely wonderful that we we met, and it was serendipity that you'd been born in Heilbronn, your Heilbronner. I think the thing I really ought to say is, of course, my mother said very little about her origins. I mean, you know, it's not just my mother. I think it was true of so many of the refugees. What were they wanting to do in the 50s and 60s, but actually really just get on with their lives and make the best of it? So I heard more, I suppose, from my grandparents, my, my mother's parents, than from my mother herself. Um, every year we got a calendar from Heilbronn, and that was eagerly awaited. Um, and but my grandparents talked rather more. Uh, they certainly were in correspondence with, with uh, people in Harbron and particularly with the Oberbürgermeister at the time. And my grandmother didn't learn English terribly well. So, I mean, there was quite a lot of a, of a, a mixture of English and Schwäbisch, which um, she spoke. So I think I found out, learned more about Harbron from my grandparents probably than from my mother, because the story wasn't really told. So my mother had come, she said, you know, I came as a refugee because of the Nazis. I mean, I, obviously I knew that before. I think I even understood it, if you see what I mean. And then odd members of the family reappeared. And I think that's a really important part of the experience of people of my generation. So my mother had come to London, she'd got her brother out, she'd got her parents out, but all these cousins and aunts and uncles had disappeared, presumed that they hadn't survived. And then one by one, odd people appeared. So it was either in Argentina, or there was a cousin called Ernst Rosenthal, commonly referred to in the family as Ernsty Boy, who reappeared as the young electrician sent to fix my parents' always appalling electrics. And uh, my, when, my, when he walked through the door, my mother had just heard about this young refugee ele uh, electrician. So she was very keen to have him. It, she looked at him and he looked at her and she said, Ernst, and I, I still remember that, must have been 1955, 1956, and he'd come out um, on, on, on some form of kinder transport, and uh, she just didn't know. But very little of the story, I probably learned more about refugees and what happened from my Schwab grandmother, who chaired the Welfare Committee of the Refugee Committee, than actually from my mother and her side of the family. It was traumatic and they didn't speak. My mother really talked about it much more, as so many did, after 1995, 50 years after the liberation of Auschwitz. Then there was an outpouring. But before that, relatively little. I would be, you know, I'd meet cousins in Switzerland. I'd meet, I'd meet people, but we, the detail, what happened, she didn't really talk about. But one other aspect that I found really interesting was she had a, a girlfriend when she was young. Johanna Eckert, so the Rosenthals were wine merchants and the Eckerts were beer brewers, which are <laughs> typical for the city of Heilbronn, of course. My, my 
family is, is wine growers, wine, wine farmers, maybe that's another connection. Um, and after the end of the war, the Eckert family contacted Liesl and, and told her the, the very typical post-war German stories about how horrible was the destruction of the city and how in, in brother is still in, in Russian captivity um, and, and how horrible life was for them. And, and I had the impression that these two cannot really talk to each other anymore on the same level because their experiences have gone so completely uh, apart from each other. But they had a daughter and the daughter came to stay with you for a while. Yeah. Did you remember that and, and how oh, she absolutely. responded to Absolutely. And she <laughs> she knew very little about what had actually happened. And uh, I mean, she was absolutely shocked. I think it was my father who told her, not my mother, uh, about what had happened. And she really knew. I mean, this is this must have been in the late 50s or maybe the very early 60s. She really knew very little about what had happened to the Jews of Germany. She didn't she just didn't know for her. The, 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 the trauma was that, you know, she remembered she was about four or something at the time. She remembered the bombing of Harbron and this was the trauma and she didn't really understand and it was even more peculiar because actually Hannah Eckert and my mother did continue to have conversations and later on Hannah and her husband Max Copper came to visit they didn't stay but they came to visit um, they did continue and uh, Max Copper and my father became quite friendly although I think my father was slightly wary of him because he had been in he had been in the forces during the war um, and my father was never convinced that he was a committed anti-Nazi but Hannah Eckert's uh, brother had been I think engaged to and living with a Jewish girl and they had made a suicide pact before the war and you know that part of it that you know that was obviously traumatic for the Eckert family but again they didn't really talk about it very much so yes we stayed we we stayed in touch with the Eckert stroke copper family I uh, and uh, uh, Heidi came to stay with us and I uh, I went to stay with Heidi uh, when I was sort of 18 19 um, but it was it felt as if it ought to be close but wasn't quite if that makes sense and so I'm really glad to, you know, I'm still slightly in touch. I'm, I'm really glad that's the case, but it, it didn't bond. Whereas my sort of bond with like the Oberbürgermeister is a much closer one. Okay. Uh, since, since our host is the Association of Jewish Refugees, did, did your mother regard herself as a refugee or? Absolutely, as a refugee. Absolutely, a ref as a refugee. She worked for the, pre the the predecessor of the AJR, the United Restitution Office, for uh, for a while, uh, helping people make applications for restitution. Uh, she she was a sort of a, an unqualified social worker. She was a lifelong member of the AJR. She was the art critic for the AJR uh, Review. She was oh no, absolutely. She was she thought of herself as a refugee. Um, and indeed, I think the reason that I still feel sort of that I have refugee origins is because mm -hmm. my mother thought so strong, felt so strongly that she was a refugee. Okay, thank you. Maybe these thank were you. My questions for the moment. I'm sure we can go on discussing. I know, but you've got to, you must know, Joachim, that, you know, my mother would have been so delighted. She would so have loved to have met you. She'd so have loved to have read the book. I mean, if for her, this would have been quite quite amazing <laughs> lovely well that's perhaps a good moment which to hand over to the other Julia Julia Weiner who's associate professor of art history at uh, Regent's University here in London uh, her very first job um, I'm right aren't I Julia was as curator of the Benary collection back in Soho days is that Dean Street, yes, yep. <laughs> uh, where she worked very closely both with Liesl and of course with Walter uh, Schwab as well and she remained very close friends with Liesl until her death. 
after uh, Julia herself had left the Benuri in 1996 to work at the Courtauld in, uh, Gallery, not the Institute, the Gallery. Um, Julia is very active in all manner of ways, uh, particularly writing for the JC on matters cultural and artistic and other Jewish publications ever since the early 1990s. So Julia, you're going to focus more on the kind of cultural activities of the wonderful Liesl, so over, over to you. Thank you very much, Monica, and thank you so much um, for uh, including me in this. Now, let me see. There we go. Um, so, as uh, good evening, everyone, first of all, it's so wonderful to be here tonight to celebrate the life and achievements of Liesl, who was very much the first mentor I had. I first met Liesl when I went for interview at the Ben Uri, having been invited to apply, as one does, um, for the post um, due to a chance meeting in synagogue, um, just as I was completing my studies at the Courtauld. The interview went really well, and I was thrilled to be offered the job. Liesl often used to say that one of the reasons I got the job was that I looked so smart and she particularly loved the burnt yellow shirt I wore, which I'd bought specifically for job interviews. <laughs> Anytime I wore it after that, she would reminisce about the interview. Liesl liked me to look smart and worried about all sorts of aspects of my life, particularly having an obsession with my pension. It was Liesl who encouraged me to start a pension when I began working at the Ben Uri, and she was so thrilled when I moved on to the Courtauld, where a final salary pension was included as part of my contract. And thinking about it, that is very much, um, you know, Liesl, as a refugee, would worry about these sort of things that um, sort of uh, that gave you some sort of stability. Now, I was thrown into the deep end a little with my job, um, as I had to organise an exhibition coming from Germany of drawings by children who had perished in the Holocaust, and indeed, Julia opened it. This was actually one of the most challenging ex exhibitions I organised in the six years that I was at Ben Uri, as it required bringing in works from abroad. But I had ample support from Liesl and Walter. It must have been a very personal exhibition for Liesl. And they also, within a matter of days, sent me her former secretary and close friend, Marion Stern, to help, who worked with me for the first couple of years, typing up letters at that time, always absolutely full of advice and support. And I'm going to talk more about Marion shortly. So here we can see, first of all, the catalogue of the exhibition, the, my first exhibition at the Ben Uri, and it really was unbelievably moving. And also um, a photo of me at that time um, in the Ben Uri. It's not actually the same exhibition. I was stupid. I didn't take enough pictures at that time. Before I had children, I wasn't as obsessive about photographing everything. So I don't have many photos, but at least you can see the gallery. Now, Liesl was honorary curator, which meant that she organised meetings at which the so-called art committee viewed works by all those who wanted to show at Ben Uri, as well as coming up with ideas for future exhibitions. The art committee under her lead also judged the annual Ben Uri Open. One issue with Liesl is that she didn't want to turn down anyone for the open. And as a result, the first year when I didn't really know very much, we had to hang works from ceiling to floor in every single spot of the gallery to make sure we could include everything. And ceiling to floor is going to come in again soon. After that, I was a little bit more firm about the numbers. One event that could not have taken place without Liesl was at the annual picture fair. Sadly, now, like the Open, no longer part of the Ben Uri programme. The pitch affair, which was the major fundraiser of the year, took the most enormous amount of organisation. Um, it took place in February, but we would start sending out requests for pictures months before, and pretty much the whole of January and February were devoted to organising it. Lisa would turn up at the gallery with a little notebook with a list full of suggestions of people we could approach to donate pictures galleries, collectors, and artists. So many of the galleries would donate. Annalie Judah, the Pilkingtons of the Piccadilly Gallery, the Fine Arts Society, and many others. Frank Auerbach donated a drawing every year, as did Joseph Herman. Some years I was lucky enough to be able to go and visit Joseph to collect the drawing. And one year, much to my excitement, he even allowed me to pick the drawing myself from the piles and piles of drawings in his studio. Sir Hugh Casson of the Royal Academy would do donate a wonderful little watercolour. 
They all did this because it was Liesl who was asking them. And she also found a few choice objects from her own collection, which I learned this evening uh, was a 1,200 works. On the evening itself, all those who had bought a 50 pound or slightly more by the time I left ticket would assemble in the gallery and all tickets would be put in a hat. The first person whose ticket was drawn could pick anything, usually the Auerbach. The next, anything but the Auerbach, and so on. It was great fun, and my house is full of my winnings, one of which is just next to me up there, which I really love. Liesel first became involved in the Benuri in the 1960s. According to an interview she gave to the Benuri's David Glasser the year before her death, um, she was the one who first went to Benuri, and Walter, who was chairman when I joined, became, late, became involved later. She remembered that under curator Barry Feldman, and I quote, in Dean Street we were so busy, a lot of artists came from Israel. Every one of the Israeli artists remembers the Benuri, the odd cup of tea, meal and comfort. And when I was writing the obituary for Barry, she told me he was fantastic at dealing with our Jewish customers, patient, polite, he had the patience of a saint. She was also really proud of the reputation of the Benuri for being a font of all knowledge on all things Jewish artist related, remembering if anyone had queries, they came. I always felt proud we were known in the trade. When I knew her, as we've already heard mentioned, she was the art critic for the AJR uh, Review, a job she had begun in uh, 1978. And she and Barry would attend all the press views together and were great friends. I remember sometimes coming across them, walking up Dean Street to come and visit me, walking together, or even sometimes traveling on the tube. Liesl was very proud of her art critic status. We can see that it was something she wanted to do when she was younger. And um, I remember when I took over from Barry writing about art for the JC, she insisted immediately that I um, become a member of AICA, the International Association for Art Critics. And she and Barry were the ones who proposed and seconded my membership of the organization, which I'm still a member of today. Liesl and Walter were also the force between some of our major exhibitions, including, um, again, what, right to, at the beginning of my tenure, the Solomon J. Solomon RA exhibition of 1990. Um, first exhibition for years of this great work of this great um, academician, only the second Jewish Royal Academician. Um, and we also uh, had uh, a couple of years later, Claude Rogers, um, one of the uh, Euston Road School of Painters. Most memorably for me was probably um, in 1991 when the two of them worked with their friend, Abraham Gaines, uh, to persuade him to show his, his idea, designs for jewelry, at the same time as he had a major traveling exhibition of his war posters and other famous works for London Transport amongst others. I will never forget Walter warning me that Abraham could be difficult and he might make me cry. I was so nervous in that first meeting. In fact, Abraham and I took to each other at the first meeting. We became firm friends and I'm so happy that my friendship with his children, Nemi's listening tonight, I can see, has continued to this day. So these are some of the important exhibitions organized thanks to the Schwabs. Now, um, as the years went on, Liesl and Walter find, sorry, I'll go back one, found it more difficult to come to Benuri. So we, I would go to them once a week, an arrangement made much easier when in 1993, I moved in literally around the corner to them. After we'd finished discussing any pressing matters, the three of us would set off for an evening meal at Marine Ices, a short walk away. I have very fond memories of our weekly dinners. I've already mentioned Liesl's contribution to the AJR as their art critic, but she had many other involvements in the art world. As already mentioned, she particularly singled out the Benuri treatment of Israeli artists. And this is probably because, as Julia's mentioned, um, she worked a lot with um, other refugees and she had a job with Youthalia, the ch charity founded in 1933, the very day Hitler came to power, which supported displaced children. By the 1950s, when Liesl began working for them, they also supported children living in poverty in Israel. So now we can go on. Liesl was in charge of the Youthalia Cards Greeting Scheme. Each year, the works of 10 artists would be selected to be used on the cards, which were very popular. 
Marianne Stern, I've already mentioned her, she worked with me at Benwari, was Liesl's assistant for five years during this time. And she's here tonight. And thanks, Marianne, for all the information you gave me about this. She remembers, in those days, most Jewish people sent cards for Rosh Hashanah, and most people would order six dozen or more. And according to the JC, in 1960, when this photo was taken, approximately 200,000 of these cards were sold. And so in this photo, you can see Lisa on the left, Marion on the right in their stand at um, the, this um, fair at the Royal Horticultural Halls. And you can see over Liesl's desk, lots of the beautiful cards and over Marion's instead, um, the calendar the calendars. So Marion remembers um, uh, this very clearly. Um, she wanted me to tell you about her second day of work. She said um, when she arrived, she'd mentioned the day before, the day of her first day of work, that it was her birthday the next day. And arriving on the second day, there was a box of chocolates on her desk. She made a real fuss, Marion recalled. She was such a kind woman. And Marion adds, it was a joy to work with her. And it helped me when I set up my own business with my husband Leonard. Highlights for Marion of this job, including being allowed to deliver cards to an American staying at Claridge's, who wanted some of the cards, and selling cards and land of the Bible calendars across the country. She also remembers a boozy lunch with a printer to celebrate the birth of his child and said, Liesl could hold her alcohol a lot better than I could. <laughs> Favorite, um, so I'm just showing you some of the cards um, that we managed to find um, between us, uh, mostly Marion actually. Uh, we've got a Scotty Wilson here, Schmuel Cat, and Julia's, um, little, at the end, Doric Dex calendar um, that was commissioned for Euthalia. But the favourite artist, um, when there's articles about the, in the JC about the cards, it's always George Hymn's cards who were highlighted. And I'm showing a few of them here. Marion remembers, he was a big bear of a man with the deepest voice you could ever come across and his cards were happy cards and I found three of the four of these when we did the designs on Britain exhibition at the Jewish Museum a few years ago and had a big focus on George Hymn's wonderful um, Euthelia cards. Um, Marion also remembers um, how uh, Yehuda Bakon, a well-known um, artist and Holocaust survivor who was taken to Palestine with the help of Euthania, he came to London and he was uh, he actually gave a sketch to all the people working at Euthania. Marion still treasures hers on the left. Liesl also encouraged her to contact Bakon when she went to Israel and Bakon took Marion round the Euthalia vis um, village. Perhaps Liesl was introduced to the Benuri in 1961 when she organised an exhibition of the cards there. This was the first time Marion visited and she bought the card that you can see on the right or the original artwork for it by Jakob Kitpins. And I thought I'd mention because uh, Marion in, was encouraged to contact back on that when I went to Israel, um, Liesl insisted I phone up Pince. I thought it was mad, but I thought I'd give it a go. I phoned him up. You're a friend of Liesl's. Come. And I spent a whole afternoon at his wonderful studio and went home with a print myself. So there you can see how much Liesl was loved. Um, anyone visiting, now we're going on to their collection. So anyone visiting the Schwab home in Antrim Mansions could not help but be bowled over by the art collection, the bulk of which was prints. Frameworks hung everywhere, a bit like that first Ben Uri open, in the kitchen, the bathroom, where this beautiful Hockney print could be found. Our mutual friend Muriel Emmanuel, who adored Hockney, was so worried about it being worried, um, ruined by water vapour. And I know the thing that most irritated Julia was all the pictures on the door. Every time you opened or closed the door, they'd all flap around and it was really quite worrying. Um, I contacted print specialist Elizabeth Harvey Lee, a friend of Liesel's, who sent me the following description of her impressions of Antrim Mansions. Walking into the hallway of Liesel and Walter's flat was like entering a travertine trove. I'd only seen pictures hung to cover every inch of the available wall space in 18th and 19th century images of the Royal Academy summer exhibitions before that. And what a wide mixture. The modernist Germans, of course, of her native land, but also modern British artists of her adopted home, uh, ranging from a condolithograph here through to Levinson and David Hockney. And of course, some relating to her interest in Vic Queen Victoria. 
Through to the sitting room, the coffee tables were always piled high with German auction catalogues as the bookshelves were lined with invitations to exhibition openings. By the time I met Liesl and we became friends, I think the bulk of her collection had already been bought in earlier years when nice surprises could still be found. My memories, apart from the Hockney, were that in Pride of Place above Liesl's favourite seat was her George Gross drawing of a Berlin cafe scene, but she also loved Nevinson. I remember clearly getting a phone call at work telling me to pop in on the way home to admire her latest Nevison, the Nerves of an Army, shown on the left. Though I think my favourite, one of my favourites, was also my birthplace, Venice, which you can see on the right. After Walter's death, I visited um, Liesl more regularly and took over the job of clearing the invitations from her shelves. She uh, refused to throw any of these away and kept all the envelopes they came in too. One scary moment was just before Walter died, when Liesl alerted me to the fact that her Jura woodcut from the series Life of the Virgin had gone missing. It might have been this one, but I think the Benuri also owned this one, so I might have got it wrong. As it hung on the door, we worried it had been knocked off, and I searched under sofas everywhere, spoke to the cleaner, Mrs M, what's happened to it? We couldn't find a trace of it. After Walter passed away, we found it wrapped up, hidden in his desk. It would, desk. it would seem he had not wanted Christ around when he was dying. And then there were the book plates. The British Museum's um, Prince and Drawings deputy keeper, amongst other things, Francis Carey, who I see his tonight, described Walter and Liesel's interest in book plates as a passion. And they both collected each other, other people's book plates, but also commissioned their own. You can see some of them here, including one by Robert Bates, that's the bottom one, which Liesel commissioned, having seen his work at Lumley Cazalet, run by her friend Caroline Annesley. You can also see one by fellow refugees from Nazism, the celebrated typographer Elizabeth Friedlander, in the top centre. Many of the book collection were donated to the British Museum by Julia and Anthony in Walter and Lisa's memory, while other works were donated to the Barber Institute in Birmingham. There was also a, what looks to have been a magnificent exhibition in 2015 in the Crawford Gallery in Cork. And here you can see um, a gallery view, Francis's introduction and a close up of some of the works. Before her death, Liesl let me know that she wanted me to have any books that Julia did not want. And so after she passed away, Julia invited me over to start going through everything. I left with four boxes of books, so still have the thrill of seeing some of these book plates, of her book plates when I pick up her books. Julia also generously allowed me to choose one print to remember Liesel by, and I went for this one, uh, by, by Oravida Pizarro as I'd just written about her, actually for an exhibition Monica curated. So when I open the books or when I pass the picture hanging on my wall, I feel so privileged to have had Liesl and Walter as friends and mentors so early in my career. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was absolutely delightful. I think that's probably <laughs> the best word um, for it, a wonderfully vivid evocation of kind of woman Liesl was, whom I of course also remember very vividly and very, very fondly. Um, now, I don't know whether you, Kim, you want to pick up the threads of the conversation. I will, in the meantime, look at um, the chat. I know there were a few things coming in. Let me just have a look. Um, right, there was a question about the event being recorded incidentally, and the answer is yes, and I will tell you more about that at the end. Um, right, a question for you, Julia Neuberger, about the role that your mother-in-law Anna um, played in making Liesl sort of gravitate towards working for the various refugee organizations, presumably quite substantial, I, I would guess. Yes, oh, sorry, my grandmother, uh, my father's mother. Yeah, uh, um, I think Anna Schwab was a huge, huge influence on my mother. She was absolutely devoted to her. And certainly in, in, in later years, and particularly after my father died, she would talk about um, Anna Schwab a great deal. I think that, what Anna Schwab convinced my mother to do. I mean, I, I think I ought to say, by the way, my mother wasn't particularly 
interested in things Jewish in Germany before the war. I mean, she wasn't, uh, she certainly wasn't an observant Jew, although she did have keep a prayer book beside her bed, which I did find some, somewhat surprising after she died, but there it was. Um, so she, but she wasn't a religious woman. My father and I would go to synagogue. She wouldn't come. Um, I think she came, she came for my bat mitzvah and she came for my wedding. Um, I don't think, remember her coming really very much otherwise at all. But I think my grandmother, my Schwab grandmother, convinced her that it was important to support Jewish organizations. And I suspect that her career that went, you know, sort of through the origins of the AJR, the United Restitution Office and Euphelia and so on, was really very much my grandmother's influence. In fact, I mean, she only had, apart from Marks and Spencer's at the beginning, she only had one um, it's a real job much, much later on. She ran the over 60s employment agency for the London Borough of Islington for about five years. And uh, I think that was the only sort of job that wasn't, didn't have kind of strong Jewish links. I mean, she absolutely loved it, but it was a very different world from, from, from the rest of the time. And I think my grandmother had a, a powerful, powerful effect on her. I can't believe there aren't any questions. I will give you time to collect your thoughts and type them in. I know it's much harder to type things in than simply to... Can I just and respond? Yes. Monica, can I respond to, to, to Julia's yes, uh, thing about the pictures? I mean, I was, I, you know, I, I am definitely not minimalist by any stretch of the imagination. You can, you can see in my study that there are just a few books around. But compared with my parents, um, my, my, my house is absolutely minimalist. My parents had pictures in places you would not have thought it was possible to hang a picture. I remember when we were finally clearing the flat, it was nearly two years after my mother died because it was sort of, there's so much stuff in it. But when we were clearing the flat and I thought finally we've cleared absolutely everything, I pulled aside a very frayed curtain and there were nine more. And they were all incredibly narrow book plates in tiny frames and there were nine more pictures and I was just going, oh, I can't bear it. How could, I never understood why they bothered to redecorate. You couldn't see the walls. It's a completely pointless exercise. But um, yeah, every five years, the pictures all came down, the walls were repainted and um, the pictures all went up again and you couldn't see the walls. Um, lovely. I'm just wondering, I don't want to put Frances Carey on the spot at all, but since I know that she is listening in, whether Frances might like to say something about her perception of Liesl as a really substantial collector, albeit, you know, of works on a fairly small, modest scale. Frances, would you like to say something? Alex, can Frances unmute herself or would you have to do it or would I have to do it? One second, just need to find okay. her. Well, well um, Francis is deciding whether to say yes or not. I wonder if I could ask a question to uh, Joachim, which um, moves away from the sort of art side of things, but I was sort of struck by how closely knit in a sense, the, you said, fairly small Jewish community in Heilbronn was and how they kept in touch with each other, both during the difficult times and then indeed afterwards. To what extent was that typical of other Jewish communities in both Germany and Austria? Do you have a sense of how it, how it compares? I mean, the, the city I've studied most is Berlin, and, and here we talk about 170,000 people. Mm. And, and of course, my, my latest book is indeed on the relationship of former Berliners, foreign Berliners, if, if you want, to, to their hometown. And again, that's very strong, but between them, of course, communication has been, has been difficult because it's just so many people. And efforts, for example, to create an association of former Berliners have taken very long in, in, in Israel. That there was an association of Jewish Breslauer from, from the early 1950s on, but the Berliners said, listen, we, we are just too, too many. And Heilbronn was just maybe the right size of community. They really all knew each other, which surely also represented a kind of, of pressure on, 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 on the young generation in terms of how to behave and and, and go to synagogue regularly. So when she when she went away from home first in, in Frankfurt, she did uh, say that uh, she heard lectures by Martin Buber, which gave her a lot of comfort. And I think we can also say that the refugee organizations were a kind of replacement for the traditional community. You, you had your circle of friends, you were united by similar experiences you, you knew what you were talking about uh, in a way maybe there were even 
little islands of, you know, where you could speak German and talk about things that, that, that everybody of, of, of them really knew and, 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 and could attach to. And this is something we have very often in these exile communities um, or immigration uh, communities that, that people just logically stick to each other because you look for those people. Well, in Yiddish, it would be a Landsmannschaft, right? the, the, the people of the same origin and who speak the same language and, and who understand the same problems. And, and I think also, of course, her personal situation, still trying to get the parents out of Germany, brought her obviously into contact with other refugee organizations and then seeing how rewarding this was. I mean, the interesting thing is, in, in well, one of the many interesting things, in, in the letters and, and postcards that mother and father write to her, it's always, <laughs> Stop thinking about other people. You, you mentioned way too many other people. You know too many other people. Not only too many men, but too, too many people in, 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 in general. And also this guy, Gerhard Gabriel, in Bombay keeps telling her, why, why do you move around in emigrant circles? Get a life. Look forward. Um, and I think exactly this looking around in, in, in emigrant circles was a kind of a replacement home in a certain way. And, after she managed to bring the parents out of Germany, everybody heard about it and everybody started sending her letters. Liesl, I still have a cousin in Germany. We don't know how to get them out. You're an expert in helping people. Um, can you help us? So in a, in, in a way for them, she became an expert in, 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 in helping. And that must have been, even if it didn't work out, but to be regarded as such must be a very rewarding experience for her. Indeed. Um, okay, a whole uh, lot of questions coming in now. Um, do you want me to say something? Uh, on the yeah, Francis, right? Yes, of course. Uh, please, please. Yes, go okay. <laughs> Thank you. I had to wait until I was unmuted. I couldn't do it myself. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, uh, I mean, I really love listening to what Joachim had to say in the two Julias. You know, one could talk about Liesel forever. She was such an important mentor to me, as indeed was Walter. Uh, and, and I treasure the time I spent with her and of course wish I'd spent much more time and asked her many more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, she was, it was fantastic for me because I could talk about German art with her. There weren't that many, still aren't perhaps enough people with whom one can discuss German art, German culture and history. Uh, and, and it was marvelous to have her knowledge and interest. But of course she, she had you know, she was omnivorous and, and her interests were spread far and wide. She gave me many, you know, really fruitful introductions. Yehuda Bakon was one, Jakob Pintz was another. We have, you know, good groups of work by both artists. Also, not in my former department, but another department, a very good representation of the work of Greta Marx, who was a great ceramicist um, and also did some drawing on watercolor. And it was just her generosity of spirit, her energy, you know, her, her interest in everything. She was very proud to have come from Harbon. That I remember clearly. She talked about her time in the bookshop in Frankfurt. She was very proud of her own independence of mind. And she came first, if, if I remember correctly what she told me, to Birmingham. Um, you know, it was Quakers who helped her. Uh, Quakers had a big presence in Birmingham, and I think she was taken on, you know, as a domestic servant, you know, what have you, for a fa for a family there, Quaker family there. And I, Julia was always incredulous at the idea of of her mother doing any housework or being much good at housework, um, uh, and that was her her routine. But you know, her determination and and enterprise. Um, on arrival in this country, it was extraordinary. Of course, Marks and Spencers helped. She had a wonderful story about working for Marks and Spencers during during the war, and I think they used to give you know prizes, in, you know, incentivization prizes for people who achieved the best sales results in every month. And she was the winner one month, and she was sent off to St. Ives. For a, for a couple of weeks or a week, or maybe just a week as a treat, and stayed in, you know, in, in um, the great hotel and in, in the main hotel in St. Ives, 
um, and immediately it sort of got to know, you know, artists, not people she'd known before, but she went along to, you know, to the pub on 4th Street and she was, uh, you know, serving behind the bars, you know, meeting um, well-known St. Ives artists, John Wells and Dennis Mitchell and, and others who were there. Um, so she had such an appetite for life uh, and such an optimistic outlook. Uh, I, I, you know, really proud to have known her. Thank you, Frances. That was lovely. We've got two other questions relating particularly to her collecting activities. Do we know how she actually, or indeed Walter as well, and indeed how did your father feel about the collecting, I, I wonder? But where, where, how did they begin collecting um, and what were the first pieces they acquired? How much do we know about the early, the early days of that? And also perhaps a more difficult question to answer um, from somebody called Rose. Um, is making a collection something to do with the experience of being a refugee? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I can start. I can start on 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 um, how they how they 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 started collecting, or particularly how my mother started collecting. Can I just come back to Frances? By the way, Frances, she absolutely adored you, mm -hmm. uh, as you know. Um, but she absolutely adored you. She, the the people who she went to in Birmingham weren't Quaker. In fact, they're quite a, quite an interesting story. So they they were the Dobbs family, and they, she went to work for them as a domestic servant. Uh, and you're right, Francis. The thought of my mother doing any cleaning is quite sort of bizarre because she really couldn't. But anyway, um, but uh, they were. Um, I think she was related to sort of some of the quite left wing families and he was a professor of maths at Birmingham University. I think they, if they were anything, they were C of E, they weren't, they weren't Quaker. But it emerged after my mother's death when I met the, uh, one of the daughters um, that actually they'd taken 20 young women from Nazi Germany uh, between 1937 and I think 1939. And in each case, kept them for six weeks as, you know, as a domestic servant, because that was a way that you could get in. If you were willing to come as a domestic, you could get in. So they, should, they would keep them for six weeks, three months, however long it was. And then they would organise for them to get more education or get some other kind of job. And then they'd bring somebody else out. And so there were 20 young women who, who if you like, owed their life to the Dobbs family. And they were very remarkable people. And meeting uh, one of the daughters uh, was great. And in fact, um, there, there were four children and I, I did give give a print from my mother's enormous collection um, to each of the children. Um, how did they start collecting? Well I think my mother, it, first of all my mother couldn't throw anything away, it wasn't just the envelopes for the invitations, it was rubber bands and it was paper bags and it was absolutely everything. When we had wanted to have prayers after her death in her flat after Matthew and I had spent two days trying to clear everything and sort of taking stuff to the dump in black bags we just gave up and just decided to have prayers in our house because we couldn't clear enough floor space for people to stand because it was just absolutely full of stuff um, but she started collecting um, when she, as soon as she had any money at all my parents were very very short of money until 1961 um, and so as soon as she had any bit of money, she would buy the odd thing. I remember we were on holiday in Cornwall and she bought a Rembrandt etching for one and six. She had an incredibly good eye and she sort of found it in a junk shop. And I mean, one and six was not a, a lot of money. I mean, I suppose it would be seven and a half pence now, um, but worth a bit more. But it was very, very cheap. And she just knew it was good. And she didn't she couldn't afford to have it framed at first and I, I don't think it was framed until the early 60s but that was a, a very early purchase it must have been in the mid 50s and she just started buying things but my father who who was keen on collecting and particularly keen on collecting book plates used to see her coming back from a sale uh, maybe at Phillips or at Christie's or at Sotheby's and she would buy a sort of a folio full of prints. So there'd be 60 or 80 prints in a folio. And he would hold his head in his hands and say, Liesl, not more, not more. But yes, there were always more. I mean, there were pictures everywhere. They had a, where there used to be a boiler in their, in their flat, they'd sort of put a, as a map chest and the, the, the completely full of, of unframed prints. So, um, and my th I think my father would have been a slightly more discriminating collector a collector my my mother just loved acquiring more and she had this amazing eye but she was quite happy to keep she would not junk the stuff in 
a, a on a portfolio that she didn't like or wasn't very interesting she would keep it all even though there was only one thing maybe out of 60 that she really wanted so um, it was a bit obsessional is that a refugee thing i think the inability to throw things away is a well-known phenomenon not everybody has it but a lot of people have it um i fear i may have inherited it I don't know whether you can inherit refugee syndrome, but um, I think I've inherited it. I'm trying really hard to start throwing stuff away because otherwise my poor children will have an absolutely nightmare time. So I do feel that, you know, if you don't actually need the stuff, then I think it's quite, quite a good idea to get rid of some of it. But anyway, that's, um, I suspect it's quite a well-known pheno phenomenon. Indeed, I know it is, but, um, she, I think the collecting thing is quite a big thing. I think the more common thing, however, is not just the sheer quantity, but I think a lot of refugees had a small collection of something small and valuable that they could pick up and go and run with. Um, in my mother's case, it was slightly bizarrely gold cigarette cases, um, which turned out to be of absolutely no value because by the time she died, almost everybody had stopped smoking. And so they were only valuable for the gold content. Um, other people, I think it was diamonds. It was a well-known thing. If you were leaving Germany, if you had diamonds to have them sewn into the lining of your coat. So quite common for refugees to have a collection of something that was portable. But my mother's art collection was not portable. Uh, if I may add, Sorry, you're <laughs> The, the idea that when your own life is fragmented, you, you, you try to put it together in, in, in some yeah. different ways. And secondly, also maybe they, they were part of, of this very specific German Jewish generation that felt so attached to their home country and so disappointed for being treated the, the, the way they were. And, and the, the, the art somehow held up a connection that people couldn't. But, but books and, 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 and paintings give expression to this feeling of belonging that had been so, so shattered uh, in, in a certain way. And this often reflects, uh, when I visit people, there's always books, there's always pictures on the wall. It, it seems to be a very, very common thing indeed. I also think part of my mother's collection, particularly of sort of the, the, the George Grass and the Kate Colvitz and so on, she, she was very keen on the German expressionists who of course, equally were, were strongly disapproved of by the Nazi regime. So she was quite, um, I think that was, I, so that was German, but her sort of German, yep. her kind of Germany. Yep. And I think that's probably quite significant. Yep. Am I right that if I can just interject there, Francis, maybe this is one for you, but also Julia, um, my recollection is that yes, she had a fantastically rich collection of German, mostly expressionist works on paper, but also the British artists were well, well represented too. And it seemed to me that actually quite symptomatic that having a foot in both camps or, you know, so that's not the right, not really the right phrase, but you know what I mean, that actually there's this kind of double allegiance still sort of throughout her life. Definitely, definitely. I mean, she absolutely loved Nevinson. There were loads. There was a wonderful, I would have put it up, but I thought my slides were getting too long. There was a fantastic Laura Knight print um, that Francis included in the exhibition. So yes, I think it was the same period though, wasn't it? She's interested, mm -hmm. but this collection was so eclectic as well. There was an awful lot of other things. And I have to say that she always bought something from the uh, Ben Uri Open. She usually would try and find a young artist because she wanted to encourage young artists. So I thought that was, that was really important. And also she really spent a lot of time making sure um, she'd get some something good from the picture fair so some people you know would just say you know they'd go for the Abach the Herman and then they wouldn't really be too bothered but Liesl had a list a mile long and she usually wanted whatever the Piccadilly gallery had given um just to come back from something Francis said um we all actually organized a celebration of Greta Marx's life at the Ben Uri where we put all the pictures up on the wall and we had her favorite music and her favorite food um, rather than a funeral, that's what we did. And it was a really emotional event. Um, so, you know, there was also a link there. And I'm sure, of course, Harold Marx, um, Greta's husband would have, I knew him anyway, but it was Liesl and Walter who sent him to the Benary. And so it made that, made that fantastic event possible. Lovely. And there are a few questions just quite specifically about how, maybe this is one for you, Joachim, how she got out. The circumstances under which she was able to leave Germany? 
Uh, Julia mentioned that already for, for single young women, uh, but how domestic, I mean, more, more specifically, the, I think domestic servant rule was really the, the the most important one. We have we have a number of um, say academics who were invited by by the big universities. Obviously, we have this complex um, history of, of kinder transport, which has been celebrated a lot in in, in recent years, but which also has its limitations. Um, and, and the third option really was for young single women to come on this domestic servant route often indeed with the idea that that maybe that wouldn't take so long but would be a kind of jumping board from where to then then find um other places um the dobbs family I, I think the contact came through another family in frankfurt who had already sent somebody over to a quaker family and maybe they knew the dobbs um but 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 think of the story. It's amazing to take in twenty people and and and, and to give them life chance for for a further career is is really something extraordinary. Um, we have a, we had a PhD student uh, in in Southampton, Jennifer Craig Norton, who is writing and hopefully soon publishing a history of of domestic service in in the refugee history uh, in Britain, which would be the first study um, of this. I know that the PhD is done, so hopefully we can look forward to. Uh, to see this publication. And then she got a, an invitation letter from Patrick Dobbs, um, and that was good enough for the the officials in Germany to, to let her go. And she, she went on the 22nd of May, I think it was, in 1937, yeah. um, by boat across the channel and then arrived in, in Birmingham. And after that number of weeks, uh, she, she then decided to, to go to London. Thank you. Um, a delicate question for you, Julian Neuberger, um, about Liesl as a mother. I don't know, you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but um, was she a supportive mother? Did she influence rather by example or both? I, know, she, I mean, she certainly influenced by example in always wanting to work and being very sort of committed as a kind of career woman. And I think, you know, she, uh, she always regretted that she'd not been a professional artist, which is what she'd really wanted to do. I mean, she'd, she'd seen herself as being a commercial artist, uh, had she been able to. So she was a, a very determined career woman. Was she, I mean, she wasn't always the easiest of mothers, um, She, but she was, uh, she was great fun. Um, we had rather, I mean, I'm an only child, and we had rather strange family holidays, since both my parents' favourite activity was basically reading if they weren't at an exhibition. So we would go on holiday to wherever it was before they had a kind of cottage in first the Isle of Wight and then in Cambridgeshire. Um, we would go wherever it was and we would go and find a cafe and my, both my parents and I would sit in this cafe with our books and that's what we did all holiday, every holiday. Um, I mean, I look back on that and think, you know, did we, I really didn't go swimming very much or do very much in the way of any kind of physical activity. No, it's kind of, yeah, they just read. And actually, you know, that they, they continued that to their dying days, actually, both great readers. I think my, I think my, my father was the, the person who drove Camden Public Libraries completely mad by insisting on endless interlibrary loans from strange academic uh, libraries somewhere else in the world. But they did it for him and, you know, they would hand deliver the books to him, um, you know, day after day, week after week. Amazing. Perhaps I can add um, a question there. I'm intrigued. She was not at all religious, you said. Your father was rather more so. How did she regard your, you know, <laughs> your, your career path in that respect? I think she thought I was completely bonkers. <laughs> um, I mean, so, so since, since I originally wanted to be an archaeologist and she thought that was perfectly reasonable. Uh, so the rabbi bit really took her by surprise and she was... Um, she was pretty negative about it at first, and then she decided it wasn't so bad since I was one of the very few women. And she sort of thought you could, could you know, you could, mm. she could, she'd get, get a certain amount of kick out of that. But I think she, she did think it was a very strange career option. I, mean, I have to say that I'm not entirely sure my father really approved of women rabbis either. So between them, I'm not sure my parents thought this was the greatest career choice of all time. <laughs> Perhaps we should begin to round things off. I've got a question that's very much about the present, about the Schwab Trust. Um, would you like to say a little bit more about that and how significant it is in relation to your parents' history? So when my mother died, um, there was a lump of cash which we 
decided to put into a charitable trust to benefit young asylum seekers and to help them access education, precisely because of what had happened to my mother. Uh, and indeed, the Dobbs family did enable her to go to LSE. I mean, one of the things that happened to her was, I mean, she, she didn't, in fact, ever do very much there. But but when she left Birmingham, came to London, that was the idea. But then, in fact, she, she, she was going to get her brother out. Um, but they had been keen, the Dobbs family, on, on her getting more of her education, which had been stopped by the Nazis um, and she was very keen on, on on refugees being able to get an education and my my father had had worked for his mother um, in the very late very late 38 and into 39 helping with young refugees so it seemed a sensible thing to do something for present day uh, young uh, asylum seekers and we set up this charity it wasn't it was very tiny we used to run young asylum seeker of the year awards in various local authorities uh, it's grown somewhat because other people have given money or left money to it or have set up scholarships um, so we have the Westheimer scholarships Ilda, Ilza Westheimer was herself a refugee she left her estate to enable us to give scholarships and so it's gone on and it's been really lovely because it's in memory of both my parents, slightly different, my father working with refugees, my mother being a refugee, but very much in the spirit of, you know, can we, they, they were in the end very successful in their lives. So can we do something to make it easier for the people who are going through the same story over and over and over again? And in fact, in many ways, I would say it's probably harder for asylum seekers coming now in a a really very hostile, I mean, there was a very hostile environment at some of the time during the 30s, certainly. But if you look at the story of the um, the British consuls who, who helped so considerably, particularly Robert Smallbones uh, and people like Frank Foley and, and Arthur Dowden, um, that, that story and that sort of enabling, I think, made my mother at least feel welcomed by the authorities i think that's quite important and so i think it's got it's got harder now it's harder for young young asylum seekers and so i think it's really important to do what we can so we still do give small awards and some full scholarships and i'm really 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 pleased that we can i think that's a wonderfully apposite and important note at which to close the proceedings today um you said the dogs were not in fact, Quakers, but you also mentioned that the Quakers helped Liesl on other occasions. And I would just like to begin to round things up by indeed saying that tomorrow evening there is going to be a talk at eight o'clock, not six o'clock, um, about by Mike Levy, specifically looking at the Quaker role in the kinder transport. But also I'm delighted to be able to say that somebody, a member of the Quaker community now, will be talking both about the Quakers then and their important role in that, but also about what the Quakers do today to help refugees in the present. So those bringing, bringing together a past and present, of course, is so very crucial and so very relevant. Good. Well, it just remains for me to tell you one quite important practical thing, as uh, Joachim has, has more than hinted, the English version of the book is rather expensive. It is uh, rather more academic, I think, in its uh, look and approach than the original German edition, which actually came out in 2016. For those of you who speak German, of course, you will have access to that one. But if you are interested in buying the English book, and I do highly recommend it, it's actually not academic at all. It's very wonderful because it meshes you know this individual story uh, with a broader history and I think many of us from what's even been said today will find resonances in this individual story with our own family histories and our, our um, yes uh, people we, we've loved and 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 uh, and no but anyway yes importantly there is a there is a discount being offered by uh, Bloomsbury Publishing if you go to their website and look for the title of the book and the discount code is Schwab 35 I Yes, Schwab 35 uh, at the checkout page and you will get a 35% discount off the, the cover price, which cannot be a bad thing. <laughs> very good. So it simply remains for me to say a very, very huge thank you. I mean, what a lovely event. I'm sure everybody will agree. This has been, as I say, so personal and yet so relevant in so many wider ways. Thank you. Julia Neuberger, thank you. Other Julia, it's very confusing having two Julias on screen at one time, Julia Weiner, and indeed Joachim too. Thank you to the AJR for co-hosting this event. And thank everybody for being such an attentive and large audience. I hope to see you again sometime soon. All the very best and good night.
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, and she'd have loved it. She would have loved it. <laughs> thank you, Julia. Thank you so much, Monica, for organising this. A great, a great pleasure, a very great pleasure. Good night, everyone. <laughs>